Hi. Uh, today I'd like to share some thoughts on 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 8. Now, this passage follows Paul's statements about his victorious and fruitful life that he lived for the cause of Christ. And it's in light of his faithful life that Paul expresses his confidence in the reward he would one day receive from Yeshua. As the text says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul indicates that he would be given a crown of righteousness from the righteous judge, who is Christ himself, of course. But in addition, Paul indicates that such a crown would be given to all those whom, as he says, love his appearing. This appearing Paul speaks of would refer to that glorious appearance of Christ when he descends from heaven in order to rapture his people from the earth. And Paul speaks of those who love this appearing. Now, the word for love here is the idea of being very fond of something. What I'd like to do now is to spend some time and explain the various ways in which this fondness will, will manifest itself in the life of a true believer. First of all, if we truly love and are fond of the appearance of Christ, we are going to think about it and meditate on it and ponder it deeply. And in addition, and in connection with thinking about it, there will be the desire to understand it more. When you love someone a lot, you, you desire to understand them more on a deeper level. So it is with the when we uh, love the appearance of Christ, we want to understand it in a more comprehensive and, and deeper way, where we think about the implications of it and the applications of it, and even the potential timing of it. Also, if we truly love the appearance of Christ, we will desire to talk to others about it. Remember that our, our Father desires that we fellowship with, with each other. Part of fellowship is sharing things of spiritual substance with other Christians, discussing spiritual realities we have in common with others. Because we are social beings and we have the Spirit of Christ in us, and because we are brethren, having the same Father, we will typically not be content with dwelling on some awesome truths and realities alone. Instead, if we truly love the appearance of Christ and we have brotherly love, we are going to tend to want to speak to others about it. Maybe initiating conversations about it and asking questions of others about it, getting their thoughts and ideas on the glorious prospect of the rapture, the great assembly that will one day take place. Also, loving the appearance of Christ will manifest itself in affecting the emotions. Our Father Yahweh has made us in a way that our emotions will be often stirred by the contemplation of things that are of great value to us. So if you truly love Yeshua and you really love His appearance, your emotions are generally going to be affected to some degree when you think about that appearance. Namely, joy will hopefully be produced in you, which is one of the very fruits that the Spirit of Christ produces, us, produces in us when He inflames certain truths in our mind so that they have a positive physiological effect on us. And certainly one such truth that should produce joy in us is the fact that one day our Savior will descend from heaven, glorify us, and take us out of this world and take us back to heaven. Also, if we love the appearance of Christ, we will uh, obviously are going to desire it to happen. We're not just content with knowing about it and believing it, but we are going to long for it to happen. In the Jewish betrothal tradition, when a woman was betrothed to a man, she generally wouldn't be able to see her husband, see that man for a long time until the day that he came for her at midnight to bring her back to the wedding chamber. If she truly loves him and loved his appearance, so to speak, she's going to earnestly desire to see him on that day. So the true healthy Christian who loves the appearance of his bridegroom will manifest that in regard to them earnestly desiring for that day to come. And one of the ways that desire will manifest itself is in the prayer life, where the Christian prays like John in the final chapter of Revelation, even so come, Lord Yeshua. However, I realize there are many professing believers who seem to have a problem with Christians who spend massive amounts of time focusing on the rapture. Sometimes they may claim that such Christians are imbalanced, that they fixate too much on the end times. They act as though it is unhealthy. It's unhealthy. It's an unhealthy distraction from a vibrant Christian walk. Interestingly, what I have found almost consistently is that the professing Christians who make such criticisms have no problem being relatively fixated on and excited about other things which have little to do with Christ's kingdom at all. They can get very excited about sports and movies video games, foolish bantering and idle talk. They seem to have no problem spending massive amounts of time on all these things. 
Yet while I assume they want to feel entitled to be excited about their interests, they can't seem to respect and enter into the joy that other Christians have in studying the end times, such as the ver very appearance of Christ. But they might insist, well, that is, it's fine to talk about it, just be, don't be too preoccupied with it. But what does it mean to be too preoccupied? What is their objective standard they use to determine uh, whether or not someone is too preoccupied with something? Does the Bible forbid getting too fixated on the rapture? As long as a Christian is fulfilling his other responsibilities in life, such as his job, his family, taking care of his spiritual and physical health and so forth, what is wrong with a Christian focusing a lot of his free time on studying the appearance of Christ? Keep in mind that about 25% of the Bible deals with prophecy in some form. Christ himself, Paul, Peter, Jude, John, all address the end times in various ways and emphasize its great importance. Interesting, interestingly, the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing on those who read and keep the words in the book is the book of Revelation, which of course contains massive amounts of information about the end times. So it is in complete harmony with Yahweh's word itself for a believer to give themselves with passion to studying the end times, including the very appearance of Yeshua himself. If the Bible is our objective standard when measuring on spiritual health, we should have no problem with Christians who are very interested, if not fixated, on the rapture. Rather, we are to be more concerned with professing believers who are not excited about the rapture. If you think about it, how is it even possible for a true born-again, spirit-filled believer not to be excited about the appearance of Christ? This appearance entails a divine, glorious being, the Son of Yahweh, descending from heaven with a shout, and saved loved ones will be resurrected and glorified along with all other believe, faithful believers on the earth. And that glorification entails being given a sinless, corrupt-free body, which is actually the very same kind of body that Christ has, which will likely have abilities that we currently don't have, such as potentially having the ability to fly and even walk through walls. And then in these glorified bodies, we will all be caught up together into the clouds and be able to see the face of the divine being who is Christ himself. How can a true, healthy believer not find that exciting? You may have heard of an ex the expression that some people are so heavenly minded they are no earthly good. Well, that might sound very catchy and witty, but it's not biblical at all. Consider that Christ himself was the most heavenly minded person who ever lived, and often focused on the end times. But was he no earthly good? Certainly not. In fact, Christ did more earthly good than anyone who has ever walked the face of the earth. He did earthly good by ministering to the various desperate and basic needs of people, such as feeding people and healing people, curing leprosy, healing the blind, the deaf, Crippled, and more importantly, because of his heavenly mindedness, he fixated his mind on fulfilling his father's will and willingly died on the cross and shed his blood in order to secure the redemption of not only his people but the earth itself. Certainly, the heaven, heavenly minded person of Yeshua did immense earthly good, as well as a massive number of other heavenly minded Christians throughout history, such as the apostles and all the great saints of the faith we read of in Hebrews chapter 11. And why was it that these heavenly-minded people did so much good in their earthly life? It's because they and only they have the correct view of what life is and what the point of life is. They understand who made life and who has the right to control life. And because of this, they are the most qualified and fit to do the most earthly good in life. Imagine someone was about to do heart surgery on you and assume that the person doesn't know what the heart is and what it looks like and where it was located in your body. They're obviously not going to be able to help you very much. They might be looking around inside of you and think your heart is a tumor or growth. This in turn may lead them to mishandle the heart and damage it, even kill you. Obviously the person who could do the most good would be a trained surgeon who understands what the heart is, what its purpose is, and where it is located, and how to handle it and how to treat it. So it is with doing earthly good and helping mankind in regard to his spiritual heart problem. The people who are generally most fit and able to do the most earthly good are those who understand what the heart of man is. Those who understand what human life is and how it is intrinsically valuable and sacred and worthy of being respected and loved. They understand the ultimate problem of the human heart, the disease of sin that plagues it, and they understand the reason for all the various evils and suffering and problems that people experience. They understand that all human beings are headed for an encounter with Christ. And if they are unsaved, they will face him with a judgment and be cast into the lake of fire. Because of the knowledge they have, they're the only ones who understand how to properly handle and heal the human heart that it might escape such judgment. But it's not just about having a heavenly perspective and sound knowledge about life. We must 
also have love if they are to do any earthly, eternal good. But just having sound knowledge about life in heaven is not enough. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, knowledge puffs up. Indeed, knowledge without love puffs up. But a man, when a man has much knowledge, even if it's about the, even it's about the end times and the rapture, but he has a little love for others, that knowledge he has may tend to lead him to have a very inflated view of himself and to become arrogant and haughty and impatient, which can have destructive consequences on his relationships and in the world in general. However, while knowledge without love puffs up, knowledge with love builds up. For when a man has a head full of sound knowledge and a heart full of Christ-like love for others, it will tend to result in him seeking to build up others in some way. He will desire to minister to people because he knows their great inherent value, because he knows they are made in the very image of Yahweh and they are worthy of being ministered to, and especially in light of the coming of the great day of Christ. So it is essential for a believer to have a sound heavenly perspective to love the appearance of Christ, but they also must truly love Christ himself and other believers and people in general. This will help ensure he makes appropriate application of the appearance of Christ in his life, so that he indeed will accomplish much, much earthly good in regard to doing great things for Yeshua. For example, in 2 Peter chapter 3, after speaking of such things as the coming of Christ and the new heavens and the new earth, Peter calls his readers to faithful lives, as we read in verse, verses 11 and 14. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. In other words, Peter is implying that focusing on the coming of Christ and other events of the ages to come should motivate you to live a good earthly life, a life that is pleasing to the Father, not living in sin and wickedness, but living a life that is without blot and blameless. Or consider Christ's words in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. The point of that parable is to emphasize how the return of Christ should affect the professing believer's life, that it should stir him to prepare for Christ's arrival by ensuring that he has truly become born again and has the spirit of Christ and generally loves the bridegroom who's going to return one day. In addition, consider the parable of the talents also in Matthew chapter 25, which is meant to provoke the servants of Christ to live vibrant, faithful, productive lives as they make use of their various gifts and abilities, that they might have something to give their divine master when he returns. The common, themes, common theme in each of these passages I've cited is the sanctifying, spiritually invigorating effects that loving the glorious appearance of Christ should have in the life of the true believer. Loving the appearance of Christ harmonizes with what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, where he tells us to set our affections on things above. One of the reasons we are to set our affections on things above is because doing so can have the effect of getting our minds accustomed to dwelling on spiritual realities and experiencing the pleasure of pondering such things. Over time, this can help train the mind so that it becomes fixated on wanting to dwell on heavenly realities, that it might experience that deep, satisfying pleasure in doing so. When a person has the Spirit of Christ and they continually dwell on heaven above and the things of Christ, the things that Christ values. They tend to excite the mind and emotions to the point that they will want to take action in some way out of love and devotion to Christ. So if you want to know how you can truly become more useful on earth in a way that pleases your Father in heaven, you need to set your mind on things in heaven, particularly on the very soon appearing of Yeshua himself. Doing so will tend to stir your heart more, which over time can lead to heartfelt, spiritually productive action. Imagine you've been out in the freezing cold weather for a long time. You don't have any gloves on, so that your hands become quite cold and stiff, and it can be hard and painful to move them. And maybe the skin is beginning to crack and bleed a bit. Because they are so cold and stiff, they are generally not going to be easy and comfortable to work with. Then you finally come to a fire or a furnace, and you're able to warm and eventually thaw your hands out so that eventually they're no longer cold and stiff and hard to move. And as a result, you can now make better use of them. It's similar to the spiritual realm. Being in this world can, that, that can be so cold to the things of Christ can result in a spiritually, spiritual freezing where our spiritual hands and feet and heart become cold and stiff. We can tend to get distracted with the cares of this life, with the amusements, the earthly and vain pleasures. And because of this spiritually cold and frigid state of our heart, they will not be excited as much by heavenly realities and responsibilities. And it can, 
can be hard for such a cold and stiff heart to want to motivate the mind and body to move and engage in spiritual work. The best remedy for such a condition is to look to heaven, which will serve as a hot furnace to help warm and thaw out your frigid, cold hands and heart. Looking to heaven in the appearance of Christ helps to put the word of Yahweh's truth in your heart. When Christ's spirit inflames those truths in your heart, your heart will tend to, tend to get warmed up and, as it were, start pumping spiritual blood through your entire being so that you will get stirred up and become more able and willing to move your hands and feet more to work in God's kingdom. As part of stirring you up, loving and focusing on the rapture, the appearance of Christ helps to keep you truly focused in life. Consider that ancient mariners would often steer their ships by looking at the stars. Ultimately, the heavens would help them to know what direction to focus their ships. In other words, they would keep looking up to help them navigate below. It's the same with believers. We need to keep looking up in order to help us navigate below. When we regularly look to heaven, we keep our eyes on the appearance of Christ. We will tend to be led to keep our lives focused in the right direction. It will help keep us from getting distracted with all the various enticements and pleasures of life that can often seduce people away from focusing their life on what it should be focused on. Remember that the world, the flesh, and the devil can combine to become an incredibly powerful, powerful force to blind and deceive people, including professing believers into missing the point of life. Tragically, most people simply don't understand what the point of life is. The ultimate point of life is not to enjoy all this world has to offer, to fulfill your dreams and experience as much fun and pleasure before you die. First and foremost, the point of life is to glorify Glorify Yahweh by being born again and to exercise faith in the person and work of Yeshua, that your sins would be forgiven, and is to seek to live a life of repentance and loving your heavenly Father with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength as you endeavor to, and endeavor to strive to understand and apply his word as you seek to use your time, energy, money, abilities, and furtherance of his kingdom through ministering to others and manifesting the character of Christ to his people and other image, bear, image bearers of Yahweh. And loving the appearance of Christ will tend to help keep this as your focus in your life. For when you dwell deeply on the implications of the rapture, you will tend to more and more see life the way Christ sees it. And you will be reminded that this age is going to come to an end. You also tend to help minimize and possibly even sweeten your troubles. And help you, help you to see people, even people who may have hurt you, as far more valuable and precious and worthy of being respected and loved. In regard to loving the appearance of Yeshua, we have seen how it will tend to manifest itself in the Christian's life, and we have seen the value of it, and that it can help motivate a Christian to live a more spiritually productive life on earth. But last, I want to point out one of the other ways in which we see the value of loving the appearance of Christ. Namely, such love will be rewarded with the divinely given crown. Paul spoke of himself receiving a crown for his earthly labors, but he also indicates that such a crown would be given to all those who love his appearing as well. And such a crown will indeed be given to you if you are a true believer and you love Christ's appearing. And the reason Christ will give you such a crown is because of how much he loves you and values you, and how much he is pleased by what you chose to set your affections on and your love on in life, namely on his glorious manifestation at the rapture. And he wants to demonstrate his good pleasure by giving you a crown of righteousness. This crown will be a reminder, reminder to you and to all the other inhabitants of heaven, angels and saints alike, that you in your earthly life had noble and righteous affections and priorities, and that you loved his appearing. Lastly, be reminded that while we are to love the appearance of Christ, Christ also loves our appearing as well. The text doesn't emphasize this, but the fact is Yeshua is longing to see each of his glorified and perfected saints in the air when he raptures them off the earth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking to Yeshua, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endure, endured the cross, despising the shame, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That joy that Christ set before him would entail the pleasure he would bring his father and also the great joy he would bring to all those whom he would die for. But also I believe part of that joy that was set before him was that great joy that he knew he would one day experience at his appearing. Not only 
Will he feel great gladness when he sees all his people gathered together as one body, but also as he looks at each of them as individuals, face to face? Paul speaks of this face to face encounter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. The implication of this text and other passages is not only will you be able to see and rejoice in the faith, face of Christ, but he also will be able to see and rejoice in your face as well, if you are indeed one of his. Christ will indeed be very happy to see you on that day, and I suspect he will be more happy to see you than you are to see him. And this is not to diminish the joy we will have in him, but only to magnify the divine love of Christ for his people. And how he'd be so happy to finally be face to face with the very people he died for. He will rejoice in them and they will rejoice in him. So may this fact and everything else I've said hopefully encourage us to look forward to and love all the more the glorious appearance of Christ. Thank you.